Hello there, and welcome to another Friday night for another episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter. I'm Rafael Di Furia, back to talk a bit more about life abroad, living abroad, and all the every little detail that comes in between. This week, I wanted to talk a bit about some reasons why you may not want to consider Portugal as your home. But just before we get into the rest of this episode, a huge, huge thank you to those of you who helped to make these episodes possible through the one-time donations, as well as the shirts, mugs, onesies, and more, but especially the biggest thank you to those of you who help on a monthly basis through rafaeldifuria.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash rafaeldifuria with the monthly support that helps this project to be able to continue. Really, thank you all so much for being a part of this, and I think it is about time that we get started with the rest of this episode, so roll that intro. And this week's comment question of the week for here on YouTube, or if you're listening to this as an audio podcast, come on over to YouTube. But the comment question is, what is one point that if you could answer this sentence for any country, whether it's Portugal, Italy, Spain, Germany, Australia, wherever, you should not move to X country if dot, dot, dot. But where I want to start out with the first point in this episode is do not move to Portugal if you are the type of person that things have to go perfectly, everything, every little last detail of your plan has to go off without a hitch. Of course, that's difficult in any country, but I would say especially in a lot of Southern Europe, if things start going on without a hitch, that's when maybe you should start getting a little bit concerned when things are going almost too well, almost too smoothly. It's normal when you hit a few bumps in the road. And also in a country like Portugal, especially if you're coming from the, a place like the US where things work very differently, you will have to get used to the daily routine. You'll have to get used to how things are done here how things are approached. If you're buying a home, the planning permissions, or applying for an exemption for the need for planning permissions, whatever it may be, it's really important to take into account that some things may not happen so quickly here. There are certain things, though, that I will definitely take my hat off and say I'm going to leave it on. I will figuratively take off my hat and say that there are certain things I have been very surprised how quickly they can happen here. That is an internet line, phone, certain things that you have to get set up uh, other than maybe banking. Banking is maybe the one place where I would say really things, there's a few extra steps that are necessary, <laughs> maybe more so than other parts of the world, whereas some other countries, you just open up a bank account. Here, it seems as though you have to apply for a bank account and you can get accepted or rejected potentially after your money is already in the bank. So that's something to consider. It depends on the bank. Not all banks are like this. But when you are going through the process of moving here, when you're doing your paperwork, whatever it might be in Portugal, there will be steps. There will be things you have to do. If you're coming here and you're applying for a visa, you may have to go to a CEF appointment in another part of the country that maybe just happens to have an appointment for you for that day, even if your significant other on that same morning has an appointment at another office that could be down the street, or maybe you're both sent to opposite ends of the country. These things can happen. There are those little, little details that you may find that you have to do a little extra. You have to take that extra little step as time goes on. Maybe you might need an extra document. Maybe you might need an extra day. Maybe you might need an extra week. But things do happen. You just need a bit of patience. The next point that I will say, do not move to Portugal if you have to have ketchup on your french fries. This may sound absolutely stupid, but trust me, there's a, there's a line of thought that comes from this. In Portugal, there are foods here that may seem familiar, but are maybe done in a little bit of a different way, or maybe there's not as much salt that are added to certain things. I know for some Americans and even some Brazilians that I've spoken to here, that a lot of things just seem to not have enough salt for them. For me, I'm happy with most things. Sometimes, yeah, I could use a little extra salt, but as is, things are fine, generally speaking. But also, when you come to a country like Portugal, it is so important to be willing to take a couple steps outside of your comfort zone to try something different, to try something new, to try something 
that may seem just a little bit strange to try a sausage that maybe is not the type of sausage that you're used to seeing, something that is outside of your norm. It is worthwhile trying a lot of the different things here at least once, even if maybe you don't try everything, because even for me, there are certain things that I will not ever get close to, and tripe is definitely at the top of that list. I don't care what country I'm in, I am totally okay with avoiding tripe. But there are people who do enjoy tripe, so I'm not gonna knock that. It's fine for you, just not my thing. But when you come to a country like Portugal, it may not be a cuisine that many people are really familiar with and have tried like different things or what is Portuguese food? Maybe that's a future episode that we should do at some point. If you're interested in something like that, let me know down in the comment section below. Because like I've said, I personally really enjoy Portuguese cuisine. So what I would say is also like kind of getting back to if you have to have ketchup, if you have to have, for example, your bacon and eggs every morning and you have your routine and you only eat X, Y, and Z and you're not willing to step out of that, then it might not be the best choice for you because there are a lot of things to try. But some of the ingredients that you might find, they may look similar, but they'll probably have a slightly different flavor than what you might be accustomed to. So it's worthwhile expanding beyond your comfort zone just to learn about what are the wonderful, delicious things that you can find here and maybe even replace some of the things that you used to enjoy. That, in my opinion, is also when you really start enjoying and start, in a way, connecting with part of the country. It's, it's a way of connecting. It's not fully encompassing, but it's a really awesome way to explore the culture, in a, in, a, in a sense, because the culture lives a certain lifestyle, which is based off of certain foods, certain experiences, and so on. But the food can be a reflection of the people, but the people can also be a reflection of the food. What we eat definitely can have an impact on our daily lives, on our health, the fuel that we get from one day to the next. So it is interesting to see. I mean, maybe there are some countries out there where they enjoy a little bit more spice and you can see they're a little bit more feisty. There are maybe some other places where they're a little bit more reserved and maybe the food will reflect that in some way. But in a country specifically like Portugal, where you have so many different types of foods, it's really worth trying. Just another example, something that I can say maybe I've been a little bit disappointed by, but like I said, I still really enjoy living here. Gelato, Italian style gelato. Here in Portugal, you have something called gelado. And it's just really, you change the T for a D and you change the accent a little bit. But the words look similar. And sometimes you will even see the word gelato written. But after being in Italy and after just experiencing all these wonderful gelatos there, it's, you know, you feel like you're coming from the top of the mountain and you have to take a few steps down and the air isn't quite as clear as it once was. It's still good, it's still fresh, but it's not quite the same. And so, having left Italy and <laughs> trying to find a good, proper Italian gelato is difficult, in my experience so far. I mean, even years ago when I was around Portugal, kind of a similar thing. In my opinion, it's much more of an American style. Not the same, but more in that direction. A lot higher water content, not as creamy, and just gelato is gelato is gelato. So what I've done is I've embraced and looked at other things, other options that they happen to have here. There are a lot of really wonderful Portuguese desserts. And again, that is another episode that I am planning on in the future at some point, doing this whole kind of tour of showing the different little things that you can get here because there are so many delicious things to try. And some that are delicious, but I would say even maybe a little bit strange. And my next point that I want to get into, you shouldn't move to Portugal if you are expecting that it will be the same or similar to Spain or Italy. It is very, very different. The people are very different. True, there are some similarities, some aspects of the culture that you may find are compatible with each other. But if you're expecting to move to Portugal, but you're wanting the Italian experience, that's not necessarily what you should do. And I have met people who are 
talking about these things. That's why I am mentioning it in this video, even though to me, it sounds so far out there. Like, well, if you wanted the Italian experience, then why not move to Italy? <laughs> or if you want the Spanish experience or the Greek experience, whatever it may be, there are certain similarities in the lifestyle between Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Of course, depending on where you are, big city, small town, north, south, east, west, whatever it may be. Although in Portugal, I wouldn't necessarily say there's the same kind of north, south divide like you might see in Italy um, or in Spain. The divides are a little bit different, different story for a different day. But even in Portugal, you still do have some differences, even from one area to another area, the, the words that people use. Like up in the north of Portugal, it seems as though people tend to swear a lot more, even in a quite religious area like where I am, a very Catholic area. Uh, it seems as though this is one of the, the centers for swearing in the country, the hubs. This is, it's like poetic almost sometimes when I hear them just blurting things out. Because it's just one of those things that's kind of like unique, the way that they string words together, having heard other forms of Portuguese. I enjoy it. But the next thing that I would say, don't move to Portugal if you're wanting to live on the Mediterranean. There are a lot of people who mistakenly think that Portugal is on the Mediterranean. Portugal is surrounded on, well, at least on its western and southern coasts by the Atlantic. Its northern and eastern borders are touching Spain. And I'm, of course, talking about the mainland of Portugal. I'm not talking about the Azores or Madeira. I'm talking about mainland Portugal. Well, if you're talking about the Azores, okay, then you're out in the middle of the Atlantic at that point. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, but there are some people who do look for what the Mediterranean has to offer. And the water in the Atlantic can be a bit different. Sometimes the waves can be a bit bigger, a bit more rough. And especially like when you get down to Sagres, down in the, the western little point that, uh, that's right off of Portugal that it juts right into the ocean. You will see a little bit of a difference from one side of you to the other side of the waters out there. But when you get even further inland uh, on the southern coast in the Algarve, things can get a little choppy when you're out a little further. But when you're closer inside, the waters can be nice. And actually, there are a lot of people who really seem to love Portugal for surfing. But the Mediterranean itself doesn't really start until about Gibraltar, maybe I guess a little bit after Gibraltar, a little further east um, when you're already kind of like in Spain and, and that area. So you will have some differences there. Just the water in Portugal during certain times of year may be a bit colder. Just we're talking about the Atlantic Ocean here. But Portugal's coastlines are <laughs> breathtaking. They're absolutely out of this world. There are so many. Um, even commercials that have been filmed in Portugal along the coastlines. I mean, there are so many places that you will see these pictures of that are just breathtaking. These steep cliffs or rock formations that are all kinds of crazy and that you can go explore and even uh, like little beaches that you can just get lucky enough to get onto if you can climb down to it. And this is the other thing in Portugal. You're never all that far away from the beach. Okay, granted, you could be pretty far inland. But still, we're not talking about huge, like vast distances. Like if you were coming from, say, Oklahoma to have to go to the beach in California, we're not talking about that. We're talking about like a couple hours, maybe, <laughs> like the maximum. But the next point that I want to get into, you shouldn't move to Portugal if you're vegetarian. This, I'm sure, will make some people a little angry because I will say there are a lot of places that actually do have vegetarian options. Personally, not a vegetarian, but from friends who are, I know that they have really enjoyed some of these vegetarian options here. But if, for example, maybe you're a pescatarian, this is a fantastic country to be in. If you eat meat, then it is also a really great place to be in. Actually, I was speaking with a Portuguese person recently, and I was I had been thinking about it that. For me, the idea of a meal in Italy, there always seems to be a bit more presentation of carbohydrates in the mix, like pasta or uh, some type of bread or a pizza, whatever it may be. Of course, not everything is like that, but it's quite prevalent throughout the nation. But here in Portugal, something that I've always noticed is that there always seems to be a dish that revolves around protein of some sort, whether that 
is from a land animal or a sea animal, whatever it may be, or even some veggie dishes. Um, or like, for example, I went out the other night, I got a bowl of mushrooms. In Portugal, you definitely should try just the mushrooms that they serve here. They can be really good, done with olive oil and garlic. And that's what I was expecting. But when I got it, it also, which was abnormal, had little cup cut up pieces of um, like ham, like not not like cubes of ham, but like sliced ham that had been then cut into little squares, uh, kind of like, say, a prosciutto type of idea and then have that cut up. And it was delicious, but you may order a vegetable dish here and it could have maybe been cooked in an animal fat or maybe it would have some meat in there uh, or. In this area specifically, one dessert that, like I mentioned, there are certain things that maybe can be a little bit strange. There is a dessert here that it's kind of like flan, but instead of being made like just out of egg yolks and, and uh, whatever, they, the fat, the, the main fat that's used in it is bacon fat, bacon grease. So <laughs> there are going to be certain dishes that may be better to avoid if you are a vegetarian. But like I said, I mean, in a place like Lisbon or Porto, whatever, you're going to be able to find places that do have vegetarian options. But to really explore Portuguese cuisine, it's a lot of fish and meat, a lot of pork. Uh, so if these aren't necessarily the right things for you, then that's totally fine. You will find other things to eat. I mean, chicken for example grilled barbecued chicken in this country rotisserie chicken oh this is probably one of my favorite places on earth for grilled chicken it is so good here but getting on to my last point that you shouldn't move to portugal if you are really into winter sports there are well there is at least one place that i know of the serra de estrela where you can go skiing for example in winter but Portugal's climate is actually, I would say, somewhat moderate. Like, you don't really have the extremes. You don't have so much extreme cold and so much extreme heat. It can get cold in this country, and it can actually get hot. I wouldn't say hot to the point where it's difficult to survive, hot to the point where you can't breathe, it's so hot outside. I've been in places that are far more extreme and far worse, but it's hot here to the point where, yes, you do definitely feel hot. But it's not to the point that it's absurdly unbearable. So for many people, myself included, I like that there's not so many extremes. I like that it doesn't get too, too, too cold, even though it can get pretty darn cold. But I like that it's also, you don't feel like you have to worry about the snow coming down and maybe having a few feet in the morning. I've lived in places like that. I've lived in places like that, and I've also lived out in the desert. I'm not crazy about either extreme on the spectrum. It's definitely not for me. But even here in Portugal, in comparison to where I was living before in Italy, there were days when I was in Italy that it was just cold to the extent that I would say it was bitter cold. Got into your bones, it just it hurt some days. And that was in the Alps as well as in the Veneto region. If you're down in the south, okay, like it's not going to get as cold. It can get cold, but I mean, even in, in uh, Sicily, there are places where it can snow. But here, now and also years ago when I was visiting and traveling around, I never got to that point where I felt that kind of bitter, painful cold. But you will find people, especially Portuguese, who complain in, about the north, that, oh, the north can be so rainy and cold and this and that. From a Portuguese perspective, yes, I would, I would agree with that. However, having lived in the northwest of the U.S., I would say, hey, this ain't half bad. This is like... This is nice spring weather, in my opinion. I mean, even uh, people from England may come here and they'll say, well, no, this is actually pretty sunny for us. <laughs> so it's all about perspective. If you're coming from certain parts of the world, if you're coming from Northern Europe, if you're coming from North America, from the northern part of the States where it can get very, very cold, it's not going to be that bad. It's not, you're not going to have that same type of feeling that you might having to shovel the snow, get a, or maybe even some places owning a snow machine these things are not going to be a necessity. Well, unless we come to a new ice age or there's some type of global shift in the weather, which who knows, we've been through a lot of crazy things in these past couple of years. 
you never know what could happen next. <laughs> but I think this is where I am going to round out this episode. So thank you all so very much for joining me for another episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter, but an even bigger thank you to those of you who helped make these episodes possible especially those of you who help on a monthly basis through Patreon. Really, thank you so much. Of course, all of the links are down in the more info section below here on YouTube, rafaeldifuria.com slash Patreon, patreon.com slash rafaeldifuria, as well as the shirts, mugs, onesies, and more. And on top, the one-time donations. Thank you all so very much for being a part of this and helping this project to be able to continue. Of course, as always, I'm Rafael Di Furia. Stay safe and healthy out there. And I'll see you all next time. Later. <laughs>